I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Jack Sarfati, a theoretical physicist specializing in advanced propulsion research. Dr. Sarfati has a PhD in physics from the University of California, taught physics at San Diego State University, worked with David Bohm at the University of London's Burbeck College, and with Abdu Salam at the International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, Italy. Jack was the basis of the memorable time-traveling Dr. Emmett Brown in the Back to the Future trilogy, and the author of Super Cosmos, Destiny Matrix, Space Time and Beyond 2, and the co-author with Fred Allen Wolf and Bob Tobin of Space Time and Beyond toward an explanation of the unexplainable. Today, Dr. Sarfati will discuss wormholes, warp drives, and conceptual approaches for advanced propulsion supported by well-accepted models of relativistic physics, and how these may offer insights into the UAP phenomena. Lenny Susskind is one of the inventors of string theory, okay? Lenny and I were students together in the early 60s at Cornell. And let me just say, Lenny Susskind is a really smart guy, one of the smartest guys around He's in terms of physics. He really is. And um, and there are parts of string theory which are now valuable because um, the parts of string theory that have been applied to condensed matter physics, you know, this holographic duality in which surface, what are called edge states, are connected with uh, what are called bulk states, and you could say uh, in a material, like in a metamaterial, uh, what are called surface modes on the boundary. So say you have a block of metamaterial, right? Say, say a cube of metamaterial, right? There are six faces, right, of the cube, and there are surface excitations, two-dimensional, but they're, they're, they're two-dimensional, two spatial dimensions, one dimension at a time, they're technically called quantum wells, and... Um, you have these quantum mechanical um, surface modes, which also connect with uh, modes, uh, what are called bulk modes, the three-dimensional modes in the interior of the of the metamaterial. And in a sense, in a sense, the uh, the surface modes are kind of like a hologram screen, two-dimensional mm -hmm. hologram screen. And what's happening inside uh, is uh, uh, is like the hologram image. Okay, and there's a lot of interesting uh, practical uh, physics, you know, applied physics, condensed matter physics, being done with this idea because uh, what's happening, these surface modes, they, they, they uh, have what's called topological, non-local topological protection, which means they can actually, uh, in certain circumstances, behave like room temperature superconductors. And of course, that's important. That's very important. I mean, they have a room temperature superconductor that has an enormous practical application. And that's kind of what I'm working on. I, I think all that stuff is directly relevant to the metric engineering, you know, finding out how these flying sources um, work. So yeah. that, that that particular aspect of uh, Lenny Susskind's string theory, really the holographic aspect, I think is very important. But the original context, the high energy physics where they're going to 11 dimensions, all this higher dimensional stuff, I don't think we need that. You know, I'm talking about this kind of the most down to earth applied uh, uh, application of the basic idea that Lenny had about the world hologram. And other people have had it too, but generally people who've worked with Lenny um uh so uh so yes and the and the thing is that um curiously enough lenny and i worked on the first paper that lenny ever wrote when we were graduate students and um and so i could say this that this is 1963 at cornell in the laboratory of nuclear studies you know hans beta and all these guys the guys who built the bomb those were our professors right and uh to go into the high strangest aspect uh, I think Lenny's mind and my mind got quantum entangled back then. Yeah, and you'd mentioned yeah. that that ER equals EPR so kind of came. Yeah, yeah, the, the, it's just the ER. And so what happened was in the strange, in the high strangest events that are partly described in how in David Kaiser's book, How the Hippie Saved Physics, right? All the strange stuff where the CIA basically recruits me into studying. They said, uh, two things we want to know, Jack, CIA wants to know. 
how does consciousness work? Physics consciousness research group, Werner Erhard, you know, with the whole thing, entanglement, and how do flying saucers fly? This is back in the early 70s, okay? Yeah. So, okay. And uh, then uh, I, I co-wrote this crazy comic book with Fred Allen Wolf and Bob Tobin, the artist Bob Tobin, called Space, Time, and Beyond. And this is back in 1974, 1975. <clears throat> and uh, we're in Paris, you know, having a crazy time in Paris, the Café du Magou. Do my go, whatever, writing this crazy thing. And in there, in the first edition, the Dutton edition of that book, I have ER equals EPR. I talk about that there has to be some weird connection. I didn't, you know, I don't have it as detailed as Lenny has it to like 30, 40 years later. But I'm saying there has to be a deep connection between quantum entanglement and quantum gravity wormholes, stuff like that. And that's that's written in. in do do you here. think? I mean, do you think this is some? I, I could be way off base. I know I'm going to get yelled at by the physics community, but it, does does ER equals EPR? Are wormholes the same thing as entanglement? I mean, in in a sense, right? You've got because wormholes, you've got a singularity that's punching through time space. It's going around time wait, wait, space. No, wait, no, no, no. You said something wrong. You may have already made a mistake. Okay confusing things okay there are two kinds of wormholes okay there are the wormholes that are called non-traversable and those in a sense you could say there's a singularity it's a, technically it's what's called an event horizon so the point is for it's kind of like a black hole okay it's similar to a black hole uh uh in fact, in fact, the, the mouths of an untraversal wormhole are like black holes because what happens is you cannot, if you try to go through the wormhole, you get crushed out of existence. So it's, it's like a black hole. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm oversimplifying a little bit. Okay. And that's because gravity in that case is completely attractive. And what's completely attractive, you know, it's basically the wormhole is like these, the, the, the mouth of the wormhole is kind of like a, uh, um, the surface of a black hole okay and and but you see the duality this is what's beautiful about it there the duality is that the epr entanglement cannot be used as a direct communication channel mm. see why because uh the epr the quantum entanglement which is on the surface by the way okay this is a surface phenomenon the wormhole okay the wormhole is like a three-dimensional phenomenon right the entanglement is on the surface, but what what is the surface in this case? In the case of in the case of our universe, we have what are called these cosmological horizons, and they are two dimensional surfaces in our future and in our past. We have something called the future uh, desitter horizon in our accelerating open universe, which is you know, uh, and that's the dark energy that you know connect with the dark energy. And dark energy, as you know, is an anti gravity field; it's repulsive. Universe yeah. field, uh, opposite to ordinary attractive gravity. And we also have a past particle horizon, which is coming like from the Big Bang and inflation, that that whole thing. So we have, so our, it's called the causal diamond, our observable universe. And what we mean by an observable universe is what we could see with light rays or, you know, radar, or whatever kind of like gamma rays, what um, infrared rays. And so we're limited by, by we're limited in what we could see from our past, and we're also limited what's called the future horizon as to what we can eventually ever see with with uh, what are called retarded light signals, signals coming from uh, the past to the present. And it's called the past light cone for those of you who know some relativity theory. So, um, so the idea is that uh, if your wormholes, if your three dimensional uh, bulk wormholes, if they are the ordinary wormholes, which are the non traverse like little black holes, if they're like little black holes, right? The they're like holographic images, three-dimensional holographic images of these two-dimensional quantum entanglement patterns that are on our past and future cosmological horizons, okay? and But that entanglement, you cannot use to communicate. See, the whole thing with Bell's theorem, all that stuff... When you read the popular accounts, if you read David Kaiser's book, How the Hippies Say Physics, and all this stuff about quantum cryptography, 
we now, you know, like the Chinese, the Chinese communists have this big space thing where they're using quantum. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's... And we have it too. I'm sure we have it too. Uh, you see, there that's ordinary quantum mechanics. Now, here's here's the beautiful here's here's the thing. What well, let's call it orthodox orthodox quantum mechanics. In orthodox quantum mechanics, you have what's called the no signaling theorem. Yeah, that means that entanglement cannot be used as a standalone communication channel. You can use it to communicate, but the information that you put on the quantum entanglement channel. Is that if it's scrambled, it's like random. You know, if you look, if you look locally at and try to look at the entanglement, it looks like random noise. Okay. You can unscramble it, you can decode it, but in order to do that, you need a key. You know, it's like in the cryptography, you need a key uh, the, to unlock the hidden message, right? So the message can be hidden in this entanglement pattern. That can happen, but to, in order to see it, you have to have a classical uh, key, uh, 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 you know, an extra signal, what's called a classical signal. And, and even in, in so-called quantum teleportation schemes, you still are limited by that. So that means, in effect, since your classical signal key that you need to decode the damn thing locally, since that is limited to the speed of light, that means you cannot communicate faster than light with entanglement. And you also... Well, they also think you cannot communicate um, backwards in time either in that case. And they this apparently they also believe if that you cannot um, that uh, uh, th that you, you're safe from eavesdropping mm. because you can tell if somebody's trying to you know e uh, hack into your into your uh, encrypted uh, channel, okay, using qu quantum quantum cryptography. All that stuff is what's called orthodox quantum mechanics, okay? That's the quantum mechanics that's taught in every college. And it's also what Lenny Susskind first, he used it. He says, when Lenny Susskind says a basic principle of quantum mechanics is that information cannot be created or destroyed. Technically, that's talking about unitarity, unitarity of the, what is called the time evolution of the, of the quantum waves, you know? Um, and um, and and he's he's correct with those assumptions. That's what, with with the, the assumptions of orthodox quantum mechanics. Lenny Susskind's hologram principle is that you have like a a, two, a boundary or let's say two dimensional uh, quantum entanglement, which is like a holographic screen, which projects a three dimensional wormhole image but the wormholes are little black holes you cannot go through them and that also means you cannot communicate uh using entanglement without this extra classical key uh, okay. Okay. okay all right and but now it turns out here's the thing lenny they made a big mistake they okay. made a big mistake here's i mean they made the same kind of mistake it, it you have to look at sp special einstein's classical special relativity theory of 1905 compared to his 1915 or 1916 general theory of relativity. Einstein's special theory of relativity of 1905, you know, equals MC squared, the atomic bomb, the whole thing, time dilation and length contraction, all that stuff. Um, that doesn't have gravity. There's no gravity there. Okay. There's no gravity there. And uh, and so Einstein struggled for 10 years between 1905 and 1915 to try to explain gravity. And in order to explain gravity, in a sense, he had to violate special relativity. What I mean by that is that special relativity still works, but it only works locally. It only works in a, on a small scale. Because what gravity is, gravity is the curvature, the bending of space-time. And special relativity really only works if there's no gravity, zero gravity. In other words, special relativity is zero gravity limit. So there's a more general theory of relativity, which includes the gravity field, which allows certain things which are impossible in special relativity, because there's no gravity, become possible in general relativity. Okay. 
Okay, so there's an analogy here. It turns out the quantum mechanics that Lenny Susskind first introduced when he said e, ER equals EPR, that's for orthodox quantum theory, which is like special relativity. And guess what? It only works for dead matter. See, that's this is now what I'm, what I'm saying. It works what are called closed systems. Unitary systems are closed systems. It doesn't work for living matter because what is living? Living matter is an open system where you're, you know, you're only alive because you're eating food and that food is an energy pump, you know, metabolism, the ATP, you know, that whole mechanism, which I don't fully understand. I'm not that kind of a chemist or, you know, <clears throat> but, uh, but we, okay. You know, there's the laser. What is a laser? A laser makes coherent light, right? But in order to get a laser to laser, you have a bunch of atoms and you have to pump external energy into those atoms, get them into the excited state. So you have a jillion, jillions and jillions of atoms all in an excited energy state. And then uh, it's like a chain reaction. And like one atom will decay, it will emit a photon. And then that photon sees other excited atoms. It's like it's just like a chain reaction in the nuclear bomb. And uh, what you have what it calls simulated emission. And all these photons come out in kind of the same quantum what's called the same single photon quantum state, and you have this coherent coherent beam, laser light. It's, it's, a, it's a, what's called a giant quantum mechanically coherent system. Well, it turns out that's what we are, but we're not made of, we're, we're laser beams, not of light. We're not, we're not things that are propagating in vacuum of space like photons do, but we have in our material, which, uh, by the way, we are metamaterials. Living matter is a metamaterial. We are metamaterials. We're natural, you know. Yeah, meta- yeah. Well, 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 it sounds like you're kind of starting to touch on the 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 Hammeroff Penrose idea. Yeah, yeah, right? uh, yeah. Okay, I'm I'm going to talk about the, only the Hammeroff idea, not the Penrose idea. Okay. Uh, okay. H- Hammeroff. I believe in the Hammeroff idea. I do not believe in the Penrose addition to it well i'm not it, saying roger is wrong roger's a very smart guy you know i know roger i i studied with roger penrose in london back in 1971 i i attended his twister seminar there's only about five of us maybe six of us and he was a young guy we were all young back in 1971 at university of london birkbeck college right near the british museum and um and uh, he's a very smart man and he's a brilliant mathematician um and he may be right in the end, but the point is, I don't need his, I don't need Roger's addition. So what his, let me explain, what did Hammeroff do? Hammeroff is not a physicist. Hammeroff is a working anesthesiologist. He's a medical man. Yeah. Okay. And he noticed uh, when he was giving anesthetics, you know, and he, he you know, he knows about um, what are called these microtubules, which are the substructure of neurons. And what what are microtubes? If you look at them, they're metamaterials. They're tubes with little protein dimers. The protein dimers are what are called like meta atoms. They're little well, electric dipoles. It, okay. And you know, if if I could interject briefly, one of the things that interests me about Hammeroff's work is so he was saying, okay, quantum mechanics takes place inside, as you've said, inside of living organisms. This is something that is just starting to be acknowledged, right? Now, photosynthesis is the best known example of this. Photosynthesis is a quantum mechanical process. And so science is just kind of waking up to this whole idea, I think. Well, no, I think we knew that much a long time ago, but but getting, no, actually the the, the main, okay, uh, I actually know a little bit about this because at, at, um, UCSD in La Jolla in the 60s, when I was there, in the mid-60s and the late 60s, there was this guy, William Little. Uh, he's a, was a professor of physics, I think, in of, at Stanford University. And he would come down, and he kept talking about that living matter is a room temperature organic electrical superconductor. And mm-hmm. he had modeled for that. So that's where I, that's where sort of I got the idea. From William Little back, you know, what, listening to him, but also another guy who came to UCSD a lot. UCSD was very popular because La Jolla is very beautiful in the sixties. You know, it's like a, you know, a dream town. You know, this uh, uh, now it's terrible because all these people are here. But this is a little sleepy little village. It's beautiful, spectacular setting, you know, on, on the coast. 
and everybody liked to go there. Well, you know, John Wheeler came down. Uh, Edward Teller was there all the time. Harold Urey, John Wheeler, Fred Hoyle. Uh, you know, they all came, and uh, and Herbert Froelich. Now, Herbert Froelich was also into the a similar uh, idea that uh, William Little was talking about, and um, what what's called the Froelich condensate. So the point is, what Froelich did was to consider a bunch of electric dipoles which are being pumped by an external energy source, like a laser pump, similar to a laser. And uh, and then the, uh, they're what are called phonon modes. There are these, uh, you know, the, the collective uh, uh, vibrational modes of these electric dipoles. And uh, he got the idea that there was what's called the Froehlich condensate. So basically the Froehlich condensate is a kind of laser beam of phonons, phonons are collective excitations of this metamaterial. That you can think of the, you can think think of a bunch of electric dipoles as kind of a, as a metamaterial. Each dipole is like a meta atom. It's a bunch of these uh, dipoles and they, they couple to each other. And now there's something called the Wu, the Wu Austin Hamiltonian. There are detailed models that people are working on with all this stuff. But what it is, it's like a laser beam. It's a macro quantum coherent beam, but at room temperature. Okay. But it's not in vacuum. It's these are collective modes that are just, you know, it's 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 like vibrations of inside the material. But you have this long range coherence synchronization. See, this is this is why this is this is how we're working right now. What is Jack Sarfati, Jack, and what is Tim Ventura? We are two. We're Froehlich condensates communicating with each other. See why? Why are you coherent? I mean, how come all those little molecules and atoms, everything is working together? Yeah, in a synchronized way. And See, so this because... this this goes to the hard problem, right? The hard problem of consciousness. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it, but even more, it's that. It's also called the binding uh, <clears throat> binding problem. Okay. Mm. So, any case, but getting back, any case, Hammeroff back in the eighties, he knew about these microtubules, and. Uh, the, the the little meta atoms the microtubule is, is a meta material it's, it's like a it's a meta it's like a rolled it's a tubular meta surface and these protein dimers are like meta atoms they're little electric dipoles i won't go into detail what they are but they're like little quantum switches like qubits you know it's just like in a quantum computer I mean, it was like quantum computers okay and um and what he noticed was that uh the way the anesthetic seems to work is that the anesthetic molecule gets jammed inside the little pocket of the uh, of the of of the protein dimer so it jams the switch the switch can't operate it can't go up and you can't open and close open and close but of course it's a quantum switch so it's a superposition of open and close yeah it's a schrodinger cat like a little schrodinger cat sort of thing it's both alive and dead on and off at the same time you know it's a qubit and so when that thing is jammed we lose consciousness mm, okay that's his idea. Okay. That's Hammeroff's idea. I think it's a great idea. It's an empirical idea. He's like, it's like, yeah, he's like Thomas Edison. Or he's like uh, Humphrey Davies, like these guys, uh, Michael Faraday. He's, it's an empirical observation. He doesn't know any math, uh, Hammeroff. You know, he doesn't understand physics very well, you know. But he's a doctor. He's a, that's not his. He's not. That's not his skill. Yeah. 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 Well, and I, 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 there are things that I like about this approach to it, and one of them is this idea that you know the, the human mind consciousness is greater than the sum of its parts, right? And I think yeah, well, that's kind of, of what that's, you're going yeah, to. Yeah, that's 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 just quantum mechanics, but it's more than that. So, um, yeah. Okay. So, so that's his idea, and then ha and then ha um, Penrose came along and tried to explain consciousness as the collapse the gravitational induced collapse of the wave function it's a whole can of worms there which i don't want to get into i don't need any of that stuff i could do it a lot easier than with i i could do more with less i don't need quantum gravity here all i need is ordinary uh you know uh condensed matter physics i can i can do what what um what roger wants to accomplish uh, in a much simpler see the problem with Roger's scheme is that quantum gravity is a very high energy process normally speaking you know it's like it's like 10 to the 19 GeV and we're like 140th of an electron volt you know so so it's like it's like uh, um, 
there's, there's like you know zillions and zillions of electron volts, and we're just one little small fraction of electron volts. So there's that problem, all kinds of problems with it. And it, it the point it's it's ill posed. It's not it's not well defined. And uh, Roger did get some um, you know some measures to try to test it, and they've done some recent experiments in Italy. And uh, so far, you know, it's been disproved. So that's a good thing. I mean, uh, Roger made a prediction. And so far, the simplest version of his theory, which is the most elegant version of his theory, has been falsified, Popper falsified, which is excellent. That means, you know, it's good physics, but it's wrong. It's okay to be wrong. In physics, it's okay to be wrong. In fact, it's good to be wrong. You know, that's the only way you make progress is to finding out what works and what doesn't work. So Roger's actual original theory has been Popper falsified, it's wrong. Now you can tweak it and try. But I think you know it's 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 beating a dead horse. We don't need Roger's theory. But Hameroff's basic idea, I think, is correct. And the point is we can do experiments now to test Hameroff's basic idea using nanotechnology, using what's called quantum dot artificial neural nets. In other words, we can make artificial microtubules mm. pump energy and give them input sensors and output motor circuits, you know, just like a robot. We make robots with a brain as a quantum dot network. And then we uh, observe, we, you know, in two ways. We we take this this robot brain, you know, it's, it's actual android, you know, can move and you know, like you saw Boston Dynamics, what those androids can do. You see how they jump and dance and do all kinds of, you know, the military's using them in combat, stuff like that. So I'm talking now, we make a conscious android, conscious robot, super soldier, right? Now, this was also the basis. Okay, let me for... finish. Though. Let me finish. Okay. Let me finish. Let me finish. I'm on a track here. Okay. And so we have this artificial brain, this quantum dot brain. We give it, you know, it can operate as an ordinary quantum computer, unconscious quantum computer. Now, we don't pump it with energy. We don't pump it into coherent state. We just let it be a regular robot. It's like a zombie. And we give it, we see how it behaves. Then we give it the juice, you know, it's like Frankenstein, right? You can turn on the switch. Ah, it's alive, Igor. It's alive, right? And we turn, we make it, we put it into the further condensate state and then see how it operates then and look at the differences in behavior. Okay. That's this is my Turing test, the Sarfati modification of the Turing test. And so we see, I claim what's going to happen is that we're going to see a qualitative difference in behavior of our um, conscious robot here, of our android, our Boston Dynamical Android. It's going to behave more like a human. Well, now. More like a dog, like an animal, like a live thing. It'll be more unpredictable. It'll, it'll be smarter in certain ways, stupider in other ways. So in any case, so the point is, uh, what I'm talking about is not just theory. It's yeah, you know, we can we can actually experiment with this, and of course it's of enormous importance because you can, imagine if if Elon Musk, if the Tesla car, we put a conscious you know uh, network, is uh, the artificial intelligence is conscious, fully conscious. Your iPhone fully conscious, your drones. Fully conscious. Hey, Jonas, say, hey, listen, I'm not going to commit suicide. I'm not going to smash into, <laughs> into, into Kiev. <laughs> so who knows? So but that's this, what I'm talking about. Well, and this goes to the psychic aspect of things too, right? Uh, but, what do you mean by psychic? It depends on you ever say that there's no such thing as psychic in the sense of supernatural. It's all natural. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The, the, uh, yeah. Okay. Remember, Central Intelligence Agency people and army we were funded by the army tank command and by the air force and this guy george koopman in the early 70s and he says jack the two things the central intelligence agency wants to know that we want you to work on what is consciousness that's where Werner Earhart gave us money and esalen you know the whole it's all um you know the physics consciousness research group and that led to uh, spinoff was the fundamental physics group of uh, uh, of Elizabeth Rauscher at Berkeley with John Clauser, who got the Nobel Prize. You know, that whole Alan Aspey came and visited me in 1980 as he was doing his experiment, all that stuff. And so we want to know how consciousness works. And that's where, you know, entanglement and the ER equals EPR and all that stuff started back then. 
But the other thing is we want to know how flying saucers fly. And it turns out they're two, they're, they're related. So even then, the, the CIA or the, the guys, they, they, they knew, but they didn't understand how they were. ER equals EPR. ER equals EPR, the Susky and Holyoke. ER is the flying saucer gravity propulsion. I, the, the wormhole shit stuff, the metric engineering. Okay. That's the ER, but that's the wormhole part. Okay. Yeah. EPR is the consciousness part, but it's not quantum mechanics. It's a generalized, what I call post quantum mechanics. See, you need this new thing called action reaction. You see, when you have action reaction, Lenny Susky, information, quantum information is no longer conserved, it's unitary. Because it's an open system. It's getting information from the environment. It's, it's, it's giving information away to the environment. It's losing information. It also gains information. Depends how it's being pumped. That's what living matter is. So living matter is non-unitary. We don't conserve information. We create information. We create knowledge, right? We create culture. There's a difference between the cavemen living in the, you know, you know, shitting in the in the cave, and now, you know, we're Look at this uh, with 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 uh, the laptop computers and everything that's going on. We created information, of course. In the large, you say the you know because the universe. Yeah, you know, if you look at a lot the universe as a whole, you might say, well, the total entropy has uh, has still increased, but in these subsystems, we you know we've decreased the entropy, so we've created information. But the point is, if you just look at us, we don't care about closed systems. We're open systems. If you look at the open system, we're creating information. And it also means that EPR can be used as a direct communication system without needing that that extra um, you know signal, classical signal. So that means that means that's telepathy. Well, Jack, <laughs> on that note, let, yeah. let me let me wrap things up for today. Let me thank you very much for your time, sir.